the studios of KPFK Pacifica Radio in Los Angeles. This is Uprising and I'm Sonali Kohatkar. It's Wednesday, August 19th, 2015. Ramona Africa joins us in studio. She's the sole survivor of the Philadelphia bombing of the Move House 30 years ago. And an LGBT undocumented activist from Guatemala has been fighting deportation while taking sanctuary in a church in Austin, Texas. We'll speak with Soma Franco and organizer Alejandro Caceres. That's coming up after the news. Joining us now to analyze today's headlines is Courtney Morris. She's an assistant professor of African American and Women's Studies at Penn State University. Hi, Courtney. Hi, Sonali. Amnesty International has joined a number of other international human rights groups in condemning the U.S.-backed Saudi-led war on Yemen. In a new report entitled Nowhere Safe for Civilians released this week, the group pointed out that bombings have taken place on densely populated residential neighborhoods. A spokesperson told press civilians in southern Yemen have found themselves trapped in a deadly crossfire between Houthi loyalists and anti-Houthi groups on the ground while facing the persistent threat of coalition airstrikes from the sky, all the parties to this conflict have displayed a ruthless and wanton disregard for the safety of civilians, end of quote. UNICEF, Human Rights Watch, Doctors Without Borders and the Red Cross have in recent weeks issued similarly dire warnings. Ignoring the accusations of war crimes, Saudi Arabia this week bombed Port Hodeida, a major port used for aid shipments, and the U.S. recently doubled its advisors aiding Saudi Arabia's war effort. Well, Courtney, this war is getting very little attention in the U.S., even among the left. Why? Well, you know, I, I think that this has a lot to do with understanding uh, the nature of the United States' relationship with Saudi Arabia and also understanding the nature of the reputed relationship between Iran and the Houthi rebels uh, in Yemen who are Shia. And, you know, as our listeners know, the United States has a very close relationship with Saudi Arabia for a number of geopolitical reasons. Um, despite its authoritarian, anti-democratic uh, style of governance. Um, and uh, in relationship to that, Saudi Arabia has a very antagonistic relationship with the Islamic Republic of Iran, um, who is rumored to be backing the Houthi rebels uh, in Yemen. And so what we're seeing here is kind of several proxy wars playing out. Um, and it's clear that both sides have committed war crimes without a doubt. Um, but clearly, Saudi Arabia has uh, played the greatest role uh, in terms of enacting violence in the region and needs to be held accountable for that. But I think if we were to talk about that in the West, that conversation would ultimately lead us back to the United States and why the U.S. has not reigned in Saudi Arabia in this conflict. Meanwhile, the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, or ISIS, has just beheaded a leading Syrian antiquities expert and scholar named Khaled al-Assad. The 82-year-old retired director of a museum in the ancient city of Palmyra was captured by ISIS and likely tortured before being killed. ISIS fighters paraded his bloodied corpse in an open city center. According to the LA Times, Assad's capture and interrogation, quote, might have been an effort to recover caches of gold rumored to have been buried in the ruins of Palmyra. The militant group, which many have referred to as a death cult, has destroyed many ancient ruins in Syria in addition to their mass killings, sexual assault, and torture. Courtney, why do you think ISIS carries out atrocities like this? Obviously, this wins them far more enemies than friends. Well, you know, unfortunately, Sonali, I think ISIS's strategy is less about making friends. It's more about compelling conversion and forcing obedience. And, and that strategy, as we're seeing, is really being enacted through a number of fear tactics designed to subdue and to discipline local populations. And as an anthropologist, I, you know, I find the use of these cultural practices of terror particularly revealing, right, destroying ancient sites, ransacking libraries, and assassinating scholars uh, and, and elders who carry the stories of these countries uh, and are huge repositories of cultural knowledge. So this is, I think, a truly distressing time for the Middle East um, and for those living in the region. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm fearful that we will see more of this in the days to come. And finally, here in the United States, whistleblower Chelsea Manning just announced that she was found guilty of several charges during her sentence at Fort Leavenworth. She will be restricted from using recreational facilities for 21 days, including the gym and the library. While that punishment is much gentler than the potential indefinite solitary confinement she faced, the mark on her record will likely add years to the time she actually serves and will make parole far more difficult. Manning was charged with, among other things, possessing contraband, in the form of an expired tube of toothpaste and a copy of Vanity Fair featuring Caitlyn Jenner on the cover. Manning is serving a 35-year sentence for leaking military documents about the Afghanistan and Iraq wars to WikiLeaks. Her supporters and her are convinced that she is being punished for speaking out about political issues from inside prison. 
Courtney, these charges sound nothing less than punitive, right? I mean, why, why do you think they found her guilty of such ridiculous things? I mean, I think that this just plainly reveals the government's decision to continue to make an example of Chelsea Manning. Um, and, and I can't read it as anything other than a concerted attempt to make her life hell uh, in order to communicate to all of us what will happen if you step out of line. And, and, and so I see this as a fair tactic uh, of another kind. But, you know, I definitely read this reading as, uh, as a punitive assault on Chelsea Manning, um, who, you know, I have to say has, I think, really managed to move to this situation with a degree of dignity and integrity that's truly astounding. And at least 100,000 people agreed with that. Um, and so in all of this, it's encouraging to see that as the state is attempting to break Chelsea Manning, that, that the people are really holding her up in all of this. Uh, yes, and uh, she would have been uh, eligible for parole by next February, and uh, these charges on her record will make that quite difficult, which is probably why she was charged with these things. Courtney, thank you, as always, for joining us. I will talk to you again next week. Bye, Sonali. Courtney Morris is an assistant professor of African American and Women's Studies at Penn State University. This is Uprising, and you can watch Uprising on YouTube at youtube.com slash uprising with Sonali or on Free Speech TV, which is available on Dish Network and DirecTV, as well as Roku. We air every weekday, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to Uprising. I'm Sonali Gohatkar. May 13th of this year marked the 30th anniversary of the only aerial police bombing on U.S. soil, an event, sadly, most Americans have never heard of. Philadelphia police dropped a bomb on top of a house inhabited by members of an African-American political organization named MOVE in a predominantly black neighborhood. Eleven people were killed, among them five children. Only two people survived, a 13-year-old boy named Michael Ward who died two years ago after years of therapy for the trauma he suffered, and a woman named Ramona Africa who joins me in studio today. She is in Los Angeles where this program is produced to speak at an event that is screening a documentary about the 1985 MOVE house bombing called Let the Fire Burn. Ramona Africa is also the Minister of Communication for the MOVE organization, and I'm so honored to welcome her to our show. Welcome to Uprising. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So you're a figure whose name I have seen, who I have read about, who I have talked about on Don't my program fall for, the hype. <laughs> <laughs> for many years. And so for me, this is amazing to be sitting with you in a studio um, to talk about such a historic event that, as I said, most Americans still have never heard of. Why is it? so many Americans outside of progressive movements uh, and outside of African-American communities have not heard about what happened in 1985? Well, it's very simple, actually. People have not heard about the bombing because government officials cannot justify it any kind of way. I mean, they burned babies alive. They cannot justify that. So officials do what they generally do. They manipulate a willing media to just keep it quiet. You know, don't talk about it. Don't do anything about it. And that's why a lot of people have not heard about it. This May, uh, because it was the 30th anniversary, so it was a prominent date, there was some media coverage. The NPR did a lengthy piece on it, um, and you joined others um, to uh, commemorate it in Philadelphia. Do you think that 30 years later there is a little bit more uh, coverage, a little bit more awareness? I absolutely do. 
And that is buttressed by the fact that people from all over the country and outside of the country, people came from France to be part of our program. It was amazing even to me, even though I was expecting a lot of people, but absolutely 30 years later, people, more people, know about what happened to MOVE, know about MOVE, and are motivated enough to come out to support MOVE. You, you didn't say this, but I, I think it is important to just come out and say the fact that the bombing was aimed at an African-American neighborhood against an African-American organization has a lot to do with why it's not better known. Much, many more Americans know about the Waco uh, 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 issue and incident. Um, but, you know, part of it also is, I think, the fact that this is part of our ongoing uh, blindness on, on the issue of racism. Well, absolutely. Let me first say, however, that MOVE is what's called multiracial. Mm. There are white people in MOVE, Spanish people in MOVE, there have been Jewish people in MOVE. Mm -hmm. uh, so but the leadership is part predominantly, the, historically. Yeah, MOVE is predominantly black, mm -hmm. African American. Uh, so to respond to your question, absolutely. This never would have happened in a predominantly white neighborhood with a predominantly white organization. Never would have happened. Tell us about John Africa, the founder mm -hmm. of MOVE. Um, his, his name has sort of reached mythic proportions, right, <laughs> these days. Um, who was he and what was his motivation? Okay. Uh, his name has reached those proportions, I believe, most likely because John Africa represents what's right, what is godly. And you don't find that, you know, out there. People are searching for that. But the bottom line is John Africa is a being that brought truth that brought honesty, uh, a respect for life. The belief that John Africa have given MOVE members is that life is the priority. Without categorization, um, we're talking about human life, animal life, plant life, the water we must have, the air we must have, the earth we must have to grow food to feed us, the sun that warms the earth. Life is the priority, and nothing comes before life. And anything that opposes life is to be brought down, shut down for good, because life is the priority. So, so that was the basis of the, That's the, basis. the sort of beliefs and, and, and system um, that MOVE has been founded on. And it's what put us in direct conflict right. with this system, you know, that doesn't care about life at all, who barters the air for air pollution, you know, poisons the water that we must have, puts you know, toxic waste in the earth that feeds us. So your uh, personal experience and the experience mm -hmm. of many MOVE members exemplifies an issue that is finally, after a very long time in the U.S., um, perhaps not since the 90s, become a center stage, and that is the issue of police brutality. Um, what happened to MOVE was the ultimate the worst expression of police brutality, the most violent example of police brutality in the history of the United States. Um, how do you view what is happening today with the Black Lives Matter movement, given the long history that you have with, with being the uh, target of police brutality? Well, I will tell you, the way you describe the bombing of me and my family is accurate. And one of the reasons that things are so out of control today with cops just killing people at random on the street is because, and I say one of the reasons, 
is because the response that should have come from the people after the bombing wasn't what it should have been. That should have been the last time that cops got away with doing what Well, they did. at least they should have been a lot more leery. And, and nobody reserved. was ever held accountable for that bombing, right? Absolutely. That's I mean, that's how right. do you allow that to happen? It doesn't matter if you care about MOVE, if you yeah. like MOVE. I've said it over and over again. We know people have issues with MOVE. Some people have issues with MOVE. But get over it. Let's deal with the overwhelming issue here. They dropped a bomb on a row house. That bomb ignited a fire. The firefighters who were there from the beginning, who were the first mode of attack on MOVE with their water hoses, their deluge hoses, when there was a fire, they didn't put any water on it, made no attempt to put it out. Now, when have you ever heard of firefighters being at a fire scene, mm -hmm. knowing there are men, women, babies, animals in that dwelling, and they stand by and make a decision mm -hmm. not to let the fire, I mean, not to put the fire out. I don't know who exactly suggested that, gave the order or whatever, but a, a crime scene, a scene dealing with police is one thing, but once there is a fire, that is the jurisdiction of the fire commissioner, and so the onus of it all yeah. has to fall on him. And that's why the documentary about what happened in 1985 is entitled Let the Fire Burn. Absolutely. And in fact, uh, I want to, this is an amazing documentary uh, produced a couple of years ago by Zeitgeist Films. Um, I want to play a trailer for our audience of this documentary. Okay. It's called. Mm -hmm. I, I just yeah. have to make a point. When we realized our home was on fire, we immediately attempted to get our children, our animals, and ourselves out of that blazing inferno. The instant the cops could see us trying to come out and we were hollering that we're coming out, we're bringing the children out, the children were hollering, we're coming out, they're bringing us out. The instant the cops could see us, we were met with a barrage of police gunfire. Yeah. They didn't intend for anybody to survive that confrontation. Yeah. Let the Fire Burn is the name of the documentary that um, encompasses and captures what happened 30 years ago, May 13th, 1985. Let's uh, watch the trailer. May 13th, 1985. Years of conflict between the city of Philadelphia and a small urban group known as Moo ended in a violent day-long encounter was one of the most devastating days in the modern history of this city. The big story tonight is the effort to evict move. The effort has turned into a disaster. Can you describe the philosophy of MOVE? We were being taught about the corruption in this system. The system, the establishment, you. Did you consider the MOVE organization to be a terrorist group? People who threaten to shoot and kill neighbors, police. I think that's a pretty adequate description of the word terrorist. <laughs> Where is it written that we could not have a religion of our own? The system had one intention, to either kill move people or to put us in prison as long as possible. It's just that simple. More than three dozen Philadelphia policemen surrounded the building after a move member was spotted on the roof wearing a hooded mask and carrying a shotgun. We intend to seize control of the house. We will do it by any means necessary. Every one of us knew that someone was going to die. Did you have a concern that the people inside that house might be in physical danger? Excuse me, to yes, ask me what well, we concerned is complete insanity. There has just been a huge explosion here. We don't know what it means, but it just shook the whole place. It was a huge blast. Did it ever occur to you that this might have been a dangerous device? Yes, ma'am. When the fire got real heavy, we couldn't breathe. Then that's when we started yelling. What did you say? What did you yell? 
We want to come out. There's no one that I know in city government that would intentionally go out there to burn those people to death. There's no one that I know of could do that. I remember as soon as I scooped him up, he said to me, don't shoot me, don't shoot me. And that's a trailer for the documentary Let the Fire Burn about the 1985 bombing, fire bombing of the Move House in Philadelphia. And joining me in studio today is Ramona Africa, the sole uh, surviving adult member of that fire bombing. And she's also the Minister of Communication of the Move organization. This film um, is uh, very important in showing the world what happened 30 years ago because although there was local coverage in Philadelphia, there wasn't a, um, you know, a sort of a single um, document that encompassed uh, a lot of what happened in one place. How important has this film been as a tool to raise awareness? Uh, it's It's been pretty good. I have to admit that the filmmaker, Jason Oster, mm -hmm. uh, he came to Philadelphia and did two extensive interviews with me. According to him, uh, he interviewed other people as well. And in the end, he decided not to use any of the interviews. There's a short clip of information from me, but it wasn't from the interviews mm. that he did. And uh, he made the decision to use archival footage mm from the commission hearings, et cetera, rather than any current interviews. Um, I would have preferred him to mm -hmm. use current information and in interviews, but, you know, it's his movie, his film. Right. I think it has gone a long way toward waking people up because uh, I get emails almost any time the film is screened mm -hmm. anywhere in the country. I, you know, I end up getting emails and finding out that it's screened here, screened there, et cetera. Um, it is also international. I know it was screened in Germany. Uh, while the international community seems much more aware than the U.S. community, I've been invited literally all over the world, all over Western Europe, Amsterdam, wow. France, Germany, Italy, uh, Belgium, hmm. I mean Spain, uh, I've been to South America, uh, my sister went to um, Cuba, uh, one of our supporters went to Africa, to Durban hmm. for the uh, Congress Convention on Racism, etc. Uh, we've been all over. The international community seems to be much more on target than the U.S. community. And Ramona, one of the things that I wanted to ask you, you talked about how um, when people tried to leave the burning building, they were met with gunfire. You and one other uh, person survived, a 13-year-old boy mm -hmm. who sadly mm -hmm. died two years ago. Um, you were remarkably then charged yourself with inciting riot and other related charges so the trauma that you went through in simply dealing with the har you know harrowing nature of what was done to you and my family and your family and then on top of that you were criminalized this is part of the system of police brutality which yes. works hand in hand with the criminal justice system yes. to say that you know when people are beaten up or harmed in any way they're then turned around and charged with resisting arrest or assault or whatever in this case inciting riot tell us a little bit, a little bit about the aftermath of the bomb one thing that people are probably not aware of is that police commissioner gregory sambor came out to our home with four warrants, warrants for four of us, me and three of my sisters and brothers. The warrants allege disorderly conduct. I think they threw in terroristic threats, which was ridiculous, um, for an event that had happened two weeks earlier, which was a non-event. Hmm. So anyway, uh, after my arrest and when I began the, the court process, 
the warrants that they came out there with, the charges and the warrants that they came out there with were dismissed. They were found to have no basis to them. They were dismissed. Mm -hmm. Now, it seems to me that if your reason for being out there was dismissed, found to be invalid and had no basis to it, how can anything coming from you being out there and attacking us be valid? They charged me, at, well, before the original warrants were thrown out, they charged me with everything that they did. They charged me with possession of explosives. Hmm. I didn't have a bomb or any explosives. They did. They charged me with arson. I didn't start a fire. Their bomb started a fire. They charged me with risking and causing a catastrophe. Me and my family were in our home minding our business when they came out there. Everything that they did, they charged me with. Uh, in the end, despite the laundry list of charges, I was convicted and sentenced for a riot. Now, I rioted at my own home, in my own house, you know. Um, I was sentenced to 16 months to seven years. And when my 16-month sentence was up, I was interviewed by the parole board. Parole board told me that they were willing to parole me with one special condition that I sever all ties with my MOVE family. I could not have any contact with any MOVE person. Now, Which goes to show that this was the idea of MOVE exactly. that they were that was the issue. They didn't ask me to agree not to riot, not to participate in any demonstrations. We're supposed to have freedom of religion in the U.S. Yes, that the right wing especially to. constantly like, holds up. Wow. So what happened? What did you do? I told them they could take that special condition and stick it. Mm. I was not agreeing to that. When they tried that with several of my other moves, sisters and brothers, nobody accepted that stipulation. So I ended up doing the whole seven years. My sister Sue Africa, one of our white members, did 12 years. Mm. You know, my sister Alberta Africa did her full seven. My brother Mo Africa did his full five Meanwhile, years. nobody is ever, was ever charged or convicted Not or sentenced for the firebombing of the move house. Not one. But, I mean, you yeah. see it today. Yeah. I mean, Darren Wilson wasn't prosecuted for killing Michael exactly. Brown. You know, exactly. it's, it's the order There have been a few day. charges over the past year in Baltimore and most recently in Cincinnati, but still no actual convictions. We'll exactly. see how those trials play out. One of the um, people that I want to talk about with you, Ramona, that you um, have uh, done a lot of support for, um, who is a very prominent figure on our program is Mumia Abu-Jamal. We routinely play his commentaries. He's been a longtime ally of MOVE. And like you and other MOVE members, he was also a victim of police brutality and was also incarcerated and criminalized. He's currently struggling for his life in prison. And we've been covering his medical struggles. It appears that he has now been diagnosed with hepatitis C, but Let he's not being treated for it. Let me clarify mm -hmm. something. According to the medical documents that uh, his attorneys have gotten, prison officials have known that Mumia had active hepatitis C since 2012. You're talking about three years. And it hasn't been treated. Has not been treated. And this is a huge problem, a rampant problem in our prison system with prisoners getting infected with Absolutely, hepatitis C. Absolutely, but I need to make wow. something clear here. Daniel Faulkner, the, the cop that Mumia is accused of killing, his widow, Maureen Faulkner, when Mumia's uh, death sentence was overturned and he was given an outrageous life in prison without parole, Maureen Faulkner was livid. And she said, well, now that he's not so isolated and it's easier to get to, maybe he'll get what he deserves now. Wow. Now, we can't get any clearer than that. Everybody knows what she's talking about. When Mumia was on death row for 30 years, 
He didn't get sick like that. He had a problem with his feet swelling up sometimes every now and then. But none of this. How is it that when he gets into general population, he has all these problems? And a lot of his supporters have uh, felt that the, essentially because they couldn't execute him, they're trying other means exactly. of uh, exactly. medical negligence or something even more nefarious. And there's no way right now for us to find out about that. Um, well, it's pretty clear. I mean, if they were interested at all, as they should be, in Mumia's welfare, his health and medical welfare, I mean, all they had to do was say yes to the community's demand to have outside doctors yeah. come in and examine Mumia and treat him. We're willing to pay for that. We're willing to foot the bill. Minister uh, Louis Farrakhan said he would fly in the doctors of Mumia's choice and, you know, kick in a, a portion of the medical yeah. expenses. And there were uh, crowdfunding campaigns where people donated money. Right, right. You know, so what is their problem? They're not being asked to pay for anything. They want to kill him. They're intent on killing him. Well, uh, we've done uh, what we can to keep his voice on the air by airing his commentaries, uh, which can be found at prisonradio.org. Finally, we've uh, touched upon a little bit of this, but uh, in the past year, the a Black Lives Matter movement has uh, finally managed to raise in a public way and in a mainstream way a consciousness among the general public about police brutality against African Americans uh, and unarmed people in particular. Something that has of course been a problem right from the beginning but is only now kind of breaking into the public consciousness in the same way that the Rodney King beating did in 1992. How hopeful are you today? You're a veteran of these struggles against police brutality. Are you hopeful that there is some change happening in on the awareness front? We're coming upon, you know, uh, and actually it's August. Uh, this is a very important month. Uh, a lot of folks refer to August as Black, Black August. August. Uh, yes. Any last thoughts on those issues? Uh, absolutely. I was just in Cleveland for the Black Lives uh, Movement The gathering. The con yes. Yeah. And I have to say, I was pretty impressed with several things. One, there was a ton of young people there. And these are young people that are ready and willing to do something. They don't want to hear a lot of words. They want information. They listen to elders, you know, as you say, veterans of the struggle. They listen to what, you know, was said. They ask questions. And they're ready to step up. And to really crystallize that, uh, the people I was traveling with, we left Cleveland around 12 o'clock on that Sunday, the last day of the conference. En route home, we found out that the cops had stopped this young man, 14 years old, said he was intoxicated. And, um, you know, the people, it was some people outside yeah. of the student center where the conference was, and they stepped right up. They, they surrounded, surrounded mm -hmm. the police car, wouldn't let them take this boy away till his mother got there. And they put so much pressure, showed such a, you know, show of strength that they released mm -hmm. that boy to his mother to his parents. They didn't take Remarkable. them into custody. Well, Ramona. It's the power of the people. Exactly. There you go. That's a great note to end on. I want to yes. thank you so much for spending this time with us. It's been an honor to have you here thank to talk you. about uh, history and contemporary okay. politics. Thank, thank you, you so for much. having me on the move. Long live all of our freedom fighters. Long live revolution. Long live Earth First, the Earth Liberation Front, the Animal Liberation Front. Long live all of those who fight you. for what is right. Thank you so Long much. live John Africa. Ramona Africa is the sole living survivor of the bombing of the Move House in Philadelphia in 1985. She is also the Minister of Communications for Move. This is Uprising. We'll be right back after this break.
Welcome back to Uprising. I'm Sonali Kohatkar. A rally in San Antonio, Texas took place this week in support of a young woman named Sulma Franco. Franco is an LGBT activist originally from Guatemala who was undocumented and faced deportation. She filed a stay of deportation yesterday at an Immigration and Customs Enforcement office while her supporters gathered outside. It is the first time that Franco stepped out of a church that she had taken refuge in for months. Fearing that immigration officials would seek her out to deport her, she was offered sanctuary at the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Austin, where she's been living since June. Sulma Franco now joins us from that church, along with Alejandro Caceres, who is an organizer with the group Grassroots Leadership that has taken the lead in her fight. I want to welcome both of you to Uprising. Thank you for having us. Thanks so much for joining us. Sulma, I'd like to start with you. How long have you been living in the U.S. and what brought you here? Before we even talk about what happened yesterday, let's get some background on yourself. What brought you to the U.S.? How long have you been here? One of the things that I came here is that I had a very difficult childhood. I don't like to talk much about what happened in my childhood, but I can say that Otras cosas que me pasó cuando estaba más grande, que era um, un poco de abuso por mi orientación sexual. Um, so I had a really hard childhood, and I, I kind of don't like to talk about my childhood, right, because it's really traumatic. But as I got older, I, I suffered a lot of abuse because of my sexual orientation. Uh, cuando, cuando empezamos a luchar con nuestras compañeras universitarias, porque pertenecía a la Universidad de San Carlos, empezábamos a tener como acciones, muchas acciones, y eso causó de que la gente pudiera conocernos y que la gente en mi país pensara de que éramos la gente que estaba causando como cosas extrañas, que causara como algo que es inapropiado para la sociedad. So when I started organizing with my friends, because I went to, to Juan Carlos University, um, I started organizing a lot of actions with my friends. I started organizing a lot of actions with, with the folks that I was around. And um, I started to become, we started to become very recognizable, right? And I think that some of the folks started seeing us as the people who were causing actions and also thinking that we were some, uh, some of the people who were causing um, some other, other actions that were happening in Guatemala. Entonces, cuando empezamos a tratar de levantar nuestra voz como mujeres, como personas de que han sido simplemente oprimidas por el gobierno, personas que han sido abusadas, no solo por el abuso tal vez sexual, sino que por el abuso, el abuso, eh, eh, por el abuso, el abuso físico, el abuso inconsciente de la sociedad, Es una parte muy, muy difícil que nosotros los, la, bueno, las personas que nos identificamos como LGBT, son muy difíciles de, 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 ¿cómo se llama?, de poder uh, luchar en contra de esta ciudad. So, we, when we, we rose up, we rose our voices, right, we started to struggle. Um, I, uh, we started to struggle around being women and around being uh, uh, LGBT identified and, um, you know, we suffered not only sexual abuse, but also physical abuse and verbal abuse and like unconscious abuse by the society because um, we, right, folks who identified as LGBT are so um, systematically oppressed in Guatemala. So you, okay. can you just uh, tell our listeners when you came to the United States and um, what, how did you find out you were actually facing deportation? Back to Guatemala, where there's so much danger for you. Okay, yo vine aquí en el 2009. Eh, empecé a ir mi procedimiento de asilo. Estuve peleando mi asilo casi por cinco años. Eh, después de ese tiempo, me mandan una carta. Eh, cuando yo me presento a migración, me, me detuvieron. Es, me arrestaron y me dijeron: Mira, y. Eh, Tu caso está cerrado y vamos a detenerte y vas a esperar hasta que podamos resolver algo de tu caso. Yo traté de contactar a mi abogada, mi abogada nunca respondió las llamadas, nunca le contestó a mis amistades, ni a mi pareja, ni nada. Entonces eso creo que complicó más mi situación legal acá. So I got here in 2009. Um, I continued to show, to present myself to, to court, um, to, to immigration, and then 
at some point I went to immigration and they, they told me that my case was closed and they were going to detain me and that um, my attorney hadn't filed paperwork and that complicated uh, my case, right, because my attorney wouldn't answer any phone calls from my loved ones, from my friends, for anyone, so immigration decided to detain me. Bueno, y después de todo eso, estuve arrestada por ocho meses y la primera vez había estado cuatro meses. Esta segunda vez estuve arrestada por ocho meses, que creo que es una de las cosas muy, muy importantes que la gente tiene que conocer, de que un, no solo fui arrestada, sino que cuando vas arrestada, vives en un centro de detención con unas condiciones inapropiadas, que la gente realmente tiene que conocer, donde no tienes privacidad ni de comer, ni de dormir, ni, ni, ni de poder hablar nada. Eres oprimida, eres tratada como fueras una cosa, y no como una persona, sino como prácticamente un animal. Ni siquiera los animales se tratan así. So yeah, so then I was detained and I was, uh, before that I was detained for four months, but then I was detained for eight months, right? And I think that this is a really important thing for people to know, that when you're in detention, you lose all liberty to any privacy you lose. You're treated as an object. I mean, you're treated as an animal. Even animals aren't treated as bad as the folks in detention are treated. Creo que hemos, la mayoría de inmigrantes sufrimos mucho ese, ese trato que, que, que nos da migración es el trato que las personas están causando en nosotros es terrible, es terrible, es un trato que donde a las 4 de la mañana puedes decidir si sí, sí, puedes comer y otro cuando a las 11 puedes almorzar y otro cuando puedes cenar como a las 4 de la tarde y no hay otra comida más. Fui arrestada en, en, nuevamente en, en el 2014, en junio de 2014 fui puesta en detención. Right, so then you get a schedule of when you're going to eat breakfast at 4 in the morning, and then you don't eat dinner again until 4 p.m., um, and I think that that's really important for folks to know that that's the way that folks are treated in detention, right? I was detained in June of 2014. Después de estar detenida, pues, me arrestaron en el, en el, el 20, 25 de junio, de, perdón, el 24 de junio, en, pues, en las oficinas de migración, y me llevaron a Laredo, después me trasladaron a Iloy. Estuve detenida ahí por seis meses. Salí de ahí con una fianza de 15 mil dólares. Después de agarrar esa fianza, pues, tres meses después, me mandan una carta diciéndome que me tengo que presentar nuevamente a, a las oficinas de migración y que, que voy a ser removida del país. Así como, no les importa lo que pasó, simplemente voy a ser removida. So I, 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 I was detained in, in, in June 24th of 2014. Um, I was detained. I was moved to Laredo, then I was moved to Eloy, where I was detained for six months. Um, after being released there, after paying a $15,000 bond, um, I got a letter three months later after being released saying that I was going to be removed um, from the United States. And yeah, without them acknowledging anything else that had happened to me, they told me that they were going to remove me on um, yeah, that I was going to have, I had my final order removal. And Alejandro, let me ask you to explain how Sulma Franco ended up at the church where she is now, and also what happened at the uh, hearing yesterday where she uh, filed a stay of deportation. Of course. So I met Sulma through an organization called Mariposa Sin Fronteras in Tucson, Arizona. Um, mm -hmm. And they gave me her phone number and told me to contact her because she was going to be released and was coming back to Austin and needed some sort of support. Um, so I had called her and after multiple tries, she finally picked up the phone. Um, <laughs> and we sat down and we talked. And right, we wanted us to, there's the project Mariposa Sin Fronteras, we were talking about starting it here in Austin because it helped her get out and it helped her feel emotionally safe and while she was in detention. Um, while all of that happened, a few weeks later, she, so, she showed me the card of a, uh, she showed me the letter that they sent her, which was a deportation removal letter. Um, and her and I started talking to attorneys and started talking about what her legal options were. And right, we had just, I had just recently learned about Angela in Philadelphia who had won. So we talked about sanctuary and how that was an option for her. Um, and after reaching out to many churches, right, who would be more than happy to, to, to house an immigrant. Um, when we said that she was a queer immigrant, closed, doors started closing. Um, and it was the UU church in Austin, right, who decided, the first Universal Unitarians who decided that they wanted to house her. 
because she was a queer immigrant um, and because this was a safe space for folks. Um, so we talked to Sulma, we met with the church, she met with the clergy, she met with some of the members and then they decided to house her and she decided to stay here. Um, so yesterday wasn't necessarily a hearing as much as it was uh, a requirement for her to file her stay or removal, right? Saying that she wants to stop her deportation and wants immigration to give her a chance to like look through more legal options. So um, yesterday she met with a few officers, a few of the clergy from the, the church went with her, right? Two of the uh, uh, senior uh, pastors went in with her um, and an immigration officer granted her um, said that they were going to grant her a stay removal in five to seven days, but that right now she would be under supervision so she could leave the church whenever she wanted, that that was their verbal promise and their written promise that they were not going to deport her. So that is victory then in her case. We believe so, yes. It's it's the first part of victory, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean um, that we're done, but it's it's a major step. And actually, Alejandro, how important is the idea for churches to be able to offer this kind of temporary sanctuary that not only draws attention and public uh, scrutiny to what is happening to a particular person, but offers a safe space um, while these uh, sorts of, you know, the paperwork is filed, et cetera. It's, it seems to be a, an effective way, at least on individual cases, to draw attention. Yeah, right. I think that, that the churches are in a very, uh, uh, on a perfect position where they can rise a, like, moral issue to elevate the moral issue more than anyone else can, right? And I think that we know that the, immigrant system, the immigration system is broken. We know that it doesn't work. Um, so... It takes a church um, to be able to house someone, right, and said, actually, well, you are protected here and put immigration in, in, in a situation of you. If you want to get this person, if you think that this person is deportable, then you need to break into our churches hmm. um, to deport us. But, right, you know that this, the immigration also knows that the system is broken, so they usually don't do that. And I think that it's very important for churches to step up and say, you know, Folks are being detained, folks are being separated from their families, folks are being killed um, back in their country, and it's the church's duty to be able to bring those, per those people into sanctuary, provide them a, a safe space until they can get those situations um, uh, fixed. And of course, it should be mentioned, LGBT folks are particularly vulnerable, not only in their home countries, depending on which those home countries are, but when in immigration detention uh, and uh, here in the United States as well. So I want to ask Sulma what it's been like living at this church in so much uncertainty since June. Yesterday was the first time you stepped out of the church since June. <laughs> Una de las cosas que yo realmente he vivido aquí dentro de esta iglesia, pues es un poco extraña, ¿verdad? La sensación que se siente, porque he tenido mucho, mucho apoyo de esta iglesia, de las personas que son tan generosas conmigo, y uh, han tratado de que yo sienta ese calor, ese afecto de que la gente me está apoyando. Y creo que eso es la base fundamental que me hizo soportar dos meses sin poder salir, sin poder uh, compartir con mis amigos, sin poder ir a divertirme, sin poder ir a otros lugares donde la gente está acostumbrada a ir. Pero creo que eso fue una parte muy importante que los miembros de esta iglesia hicieron conmigo. I think one of the experiences that I've had here with the members, right, is that they've shown a lot of warmth and a lot of love towards me. Um, they've been able, they, that, that really has been the reason why I've been able to 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 go a lot to to be here for two months without going outside, without going to, to see my friends, without going to have fun, with you know basically being in this church. I think that the love and the warmth that they've shown me, um, the support that they've all shown me to to feel welcomed here has been has really gotten me through um, through this time. And was there a fear yesterday that uh, stepping out of the church you might be detained? Yeah. And Sí, realmente estaba un poco nerviosa, un poco asustada, porque realmente no sabemos cómo trabaja exactamente migración. Migración puede tomar una decisión de un momento a otro, puede decir una cosa, pero de un momento a otro puede cambiar su opinión. Entonces sí, estaba un poco nerviosa y de, de presentarme y entrar y no tener todo ese apoyo, pero realmente las cosas fueron diferentes. Tuve todo el apoyo de la gente de la iglesia y de otras organizaciones que estuvieron conmigo, Y creo que eso fue una base fundamental para todo lo que se llevó a cabo el día de ayer. 
Yeah, I was I was a bit nervous, right, and a bit scared. Um, I we don't know how immigration works, right? I mean, they can say one thing and then they immediately change their mind. So it was it was I was a little bit nervous and a little bit scared that immigration was going to change their mind on the things that they had been saying. Um, but there was a lot of support from the community. There was a lot of support from the church. There was a lot of support from the church members and different organizations. So I think that that's what helped me get over uh, get over some of my nerves. And there's been a lot of coverage, Alejandro, recently um, of the issue of sanctuary cities. Uh, we've been talking about churches, but there are cities like San Francisco that have certain policies that attempt to protect uh, undocumented immigrants from deportation. And uh, because of the case of a young woman, a white woman being allegedly killed at the hands of an undocumented immigrant in San Francisco, that policy has come under greater scrutiny. Uh, presidential candidates like Donald Trump and others have Marco Rubio have attempted to demonize immigrants. And uh, I'm wondering how that cr that sort of demonization and criminalization of immigrants has made life much harder for people like Sulma. Yeah, I, I, right. I think that the xenophobia um, of, of these kind of things, right, of people using immigrants as scapegoats, right, um, has been very problematic, and I think that even here in the city of Austin, right after after it happened and after what happened in San Francisco, I know that the city of Austin started getting a lot of phone calls, um, you know, saying that we needed to not be a sanctuary city, even though we're not. And and I think that this has been problematic, right? I think it's very disrespectful for politicians like Donald Trump, the Republican Party, and and, and everyone else, right? To not 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 saying that the Democrats haven't done this, but everyone else to say, oh well, you know it. Yeah, we need to be stricter on our laws. We need to do X, Y, and Z. When, when they know that the system is broken, when they know that all they're doing is using scapegoats, right? Um, right. I don't see any of them. I don't see any politicians talking about what is named Dylan Roof saying that actually white supremacy is a problem because he's yeah. the representative of all of this, right? So, I, I think that it's it's a, it's a massive double standard of whenever uh, a black or brown person commits a crime, they are all of a sudden the representation of all of their people, but. When white folks do it, then it's just an anomaly. It's not something that usually happens. Right. And uh, studies have shown that uh, crime is significantly lower among immigrant communities than it is among non-immigrant communities. I want to finally ask, uh, Sulma, what you your plans are for the next few weeks. Uh, have you felt a relief at the uh, beginning of what might be a victory yesterday? <laughs> Pienso que uno de los planes más grandes de seguir trabajando con la comunidad y seguir apoyando. Creo que he adquirido mucho conocimiento para seguir organizando. Eh, yo no soy la única persona que está siendo sometida bajo las órdenes de migración y que toma decisiones como muy fuertes. Creo que hay muchos inmigrantes que necesitan ese apoyo. Voy a seguir apoyando a esta, a esta gente que que viven en la sombra y queremos sacar la voz de esas personas que viven en la sombra como inmigrantes y decirles sí se puede y yo soy un claro ejemplo de que sí se puede cuando tú quieres hacer algo se puede pero tienes que luchar en contra de todas esas reglas que en algún momento son como muy difíciles algunas absurdas pero son las reglas y vamos a luchar en todo en contra de eso um, I think that I right I, some of my plans are that I, I, I... I want to, I'm not the only person that needs this, um, and there's a lot of folks out there who really need who really need to be able to speak up, and I think that I want to help. While being in here, I've gotten a lot of resources and knowledge of like how I can continue to organize, so that's what I want to do. I want to continue to organize um, with the immigrant community. I want to support the immigrant community. I think that I'm a perfect example of you can do it right, that you can struggle and you can win. Um, these immigrant laws are, are, are unjust, they're unfair. Um, and they're, 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 the, they're the rules, right? They're the laws, and I want to be able to make sure that we continue to fight against these laws and continue to win. And finally, Alejandro, uh, just uh, really quickly, the reason why people like Sulma and others have uh, attempted to take refuge in churches is because, as Sulma was saying earlier, the conditions within the detention centers are pretty uh, brutal, particularly the so-called family detention centers. Uh, you have places like Eloy uh, in Arizona and Carnes Center in, in Texas. Uh, and this is a, something new under President Obama. It was under Bush. It was stopped. They stopped detaining 
families and then uh, Obama restarted that again. Do you have any sense that as we head into a presidential election that the anti-immigrant hype is going to get worse? Policies like family detention are just simply going to be uh, set in stone, cemented even, even more? Hopefully not, right? Um, and this is the type of work the grassroots leadership is doing, right? I mean, I think that the problem is that most folks are surprised when you tell them that there's kids in detention, that there's families in detention, and they're, they don't know about it. Because um, I don't think that these politicians could get away with with not even bringing up family detention in their platform, with not even mentioning that there's families right now being detained, that there's queer immigrants being sexually assaulted in detention. Um, if more of the community knew about what was happening. Um, and yeah, there is, of course, a little fear that the, the that there will be immigrant backlash. But I think that, you know, I honestly think that that has been immigrants' reality since 2001, uh, since uh, September 11 of 2001. There's been backlash and scapegoat, uh, uh, right, blaming immigrants for absolutely everything that happens. Um, and I think that there's amazing organizers like Sulma um, who are fighting against that. And I think that that's what I see, right, as if there's more aggression, then there will be more resistance yes. by the immigrant community. Well, I want to thank the two of you so much for joining us. Best of luck to both of you, especially Sulma, and, uh, and we'll certainly follow this story. Thank you. Sulma Franco is an LGBT rights activist from Guatemala and had been facing deportation, has won a temporary reprieve. Alejandro Caceres is an organizer in Texas based with the group Grassroots Leadership, who's been helping Sulma. This is Uprising. Anna Buss is our assistant producer and technical director. Christian Beck is our production coordinator. Kiana Turner is our visual editor. And with Teddy Robinson is also an audio engineer. Special thanks to Jonathan Alexander. Subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash uprising with sonali our website is uprising with sonali.com our theme music is by quetzal i'm sonali kohatkar host and executive producer of uprising i'll see you next time